Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rochelle and I'm going to give you a talk about AI algorithms, the nature of AI algorithms. Um, so the reason I think this talk came up is it's quite fascinating when you look around at what's happening in AI and machine learning and deep learning and you kind of see all of the crazy stuff people are doing, um, putting different people's faces on videos and it looks super, super realistic making use of uh, this technology in movies and games and all, all sorts of things like that. And you f kind of feel like it's a bit out of reach for you as a you know, developer to kind of make use of these, these algorithms. So um, I wanted to kind of demystify some of them. So a little bit about me. I'm from Johannesburg, so it's nice to be here in Cape Town. Um, I work at a company called Intellect. We do custom software engineering for big corporates. Um, I've worked in a variety of different domains in the past, agriculture, finance, gaming, fitness, all sorts of things, um, which has taught me a lot, I've learned a lot from those, those experiences. I like to write and speak and share, share knowledge, experiment with new things, um, always tinkering. I also run the AIZA meetup groups, so we, we're also trying to kick them off here in Cape Town again, so keep an eye out and meet up for that. All right, so when you think about artificial intelligence, um, how do you define it? It's very difficult to define. When you think about intelligence, <coughs> it's even more difficult to, to figure that out because as humans, since we're so intelligent, we think we're the benchmark for intelligence. So that definition is based on us. But as you see in the description of the talk, I don't really want to get into that. I've gone into that before in, in other talks. Um, I want to make this a little bit more practical. So if you have a spreadsheet of data and you're making sense of that data and you make a chart and some graphs and some statistics about it, do you think that's artificial intelligence? No? Yes? No. Okay, what about when you're routing on your GPS and you're trying to find the best route to a specific location? Do you think that might be artificial intelligence? Maybe, maybe not, maybe. maybe. Uh, what about a chatbot? So if you're interfacing with a bank, these, these days banks love these things, um, or any kind of retailer, do you think that's artificial intelligence? Or Siri, Google Home, Google Assistant? Maybe, still, what about blockchain? Is blockchain AI? So now it's no, right? So one definition for AI is something that hasn't been solved yet. Anything new, right? That hasn't, hasn't uh, solved a specific problem in, a, in, in that way before, and that might be AI. So it's very hard to kind of figure out what is AI and what isn't AI. In all of these examples, there could be an aspect of it, depending on how it's implemented. How about this, when you're using those filters on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, um, you'd think that's AI, right? So doing some image processing to, um, I don't know, change your features, maybe. Um, what about something that can predict the stock market and buy and sell and hold on your behalf? Um, what about something that plays StarCraft or Dota? So you've seen OpenAI and DeepMind uh, do a lot of work there. So these games just look at the visuals, uh, sorry, these AIs look at the visuals of a game and make decisions just based on that, no APIs, uh, just based on what's happening on a screen. So now things are starting to be more AI-y, right? Um, what about something that can look at imagery from brain scans and x-rays and, and things like that and identify anomalies better than a doctor could. Get, getting closer, maybe. Something that can identify traffic on large network satellites, network towers, servers, look at those logs, look at the people using them, figure out best routing for that. Still could be AI. Self-driving cars, that's also something popular. Looking at imagery and figuring out what decisions to make based on an ever-changing environment. Or, who's watched Bandersnatch on Netflix? 
right? So I, I think that Netflix are trying to psychologically profile us based on our decisions being made while, while playing Bandersnatch or going through that, that experience. Um, and all of these things could be AI or couldn't be AI. So let's have a look at some of the algorithms behind some of these applications for it. But what are algorithms? So we're all developers, we all have used this word before, and to our clients and to business, algorithms are magic, right? And if we, we, we need to explain how we did something, we're like, well, we used an algorithm, and they believe us, <laughs> right? And this is our algorithm. Um, okay, so, good old Elon. Maybe, it's backed by science, maybe it's a formula or some sort of uh, calculation that we're doing. Maybe it's a step-by-step -step process that we're following, we're making decisions. But in essence, an algorithm is just a recipe. So we've got a bunch of ingredients that we have and we mix them in a certain way to give us a specific output. And depending on the ingredients and the way that you use them, you might get very different outputs. But the steps usually remain the same. And in computer science or development, a lot of that is based on data structures. So a quick refresher on data structures, the simplest one that we're all familiar with, an array, right? Just uh, a bunch of different values that are indexed and we can reference them. A stack, so you put things in and it's first in, uh, last out, right? So you push and pop things. You have a queue. And this is usually things that are sequenced in, uh, yeah, things that are put in the sequence that they should be processed. So in queuing things and dequeuing things, first in, first out. You have linked lists, so it's different objects or different values that link to, uh, to others. And then you get to a bit more interesting things like a graph. So they consist of nodes with vertices, uh, with edges between them. So the nodes are called vertices, you've got edges between them and it indicates some sort of relationship between those different objects or values. And then you have a tree. So you might be familiar with the tree where you make decisions in this tree or you've got um, different objects that reference other objects and usually it's never cyclic. So you never have a cycle that you'd get into whereas in this graph we do have a lot of cycles in them. And Graphs and trees, although they're very simple concepts, they're used quite intensely in artificial intelligence algorithms. Even neural networks are a form of graph. Very complex graphs, but if you understand graphs, you'll understand neural networks a lot easier. Okay, so let's talk about planning uh, and intelligence. So one of the most basic forms of intelligence is the ability to plan. So if we're going to a trip to Durban, from Johannesburg, let's say that's Johannesburg and that's Durban. Uh, we've made a plan, we've said, okay, we're gonna have two stops, we'll stop there and eat, or go to a petting zoo, and then we're gonna, we're gonna stop here and eat, and then we're gonna make our way down to Durban, we have accommodation at the Triangle, we're gonna visit three locations, um, and that's our trip down there, right? So on our way there, something goes wrong. We get to the restaurant that we wanted to eat at and we realize it's closed. We're really hungry from the petting zoo, so we really need to eat. So we find another location that's really close by um, and then realize that when the road we wanted to take is now closed, it's closed during the night time. So what we end up having to do is get accommodation in a different place close by so we can travel the next day to our final destination. And this stuff happens, in real life this stuff happens all the time. So how does a computer understand how to deal with these, these problems? As a human, we can intuitively understand we had a plan, we need to adjust this plan. And what do we do to figure out how we adjust it? Well, we search, right? So we search through different possibilities, and we're really good at this. We're really good at figuring out patterns and figuring out what the options could be. So we look at some search algorithms, um, and this little example here given a maze. This maze is pretty easy to solve, right? You could easily find the shortest path. If I give you five seconds to look at it, um, 
you'd, you'd know which path is the shortest to the goal, which is the star. But when you actually need to compute all of the different um, paths to that goal, this is what it actually looks like. These are, this is every single path from your start location to the end in this little maze. And you can see how complex it is for a computer to try and figure this out. Uh, whereas as a human, we simply look at it and, and know the right way there. So this brings me to some of the very basic algorithms which sometimes in 2019 aren't considered AI anymore. They call it old AI. So breath first search. So if this is our tree of decisions that we'd need to make to get to our goal, where the stars indicate the goal, these are the different paths we could take. What breath first search does is it tries to look at each level of this tree. So in this case, we're looking at the option of going right and going down. Okay, so you've got down and right. Then it will say, okay, we've gone down, what are the next options? We could go left or right. And on the other side of it, if we went right, we can go down or we could go right again. So I've included a rule here to ensure that this tree doesn't explode and, and become cyclic, to say that you can't visit a block that you've already visited. And that's what actually makes this tree a lot smaller than it would be um, and removes the cycles. So breath first search will work through that until it eventually finds one of these stars and then you would have your path to your goal, right? Um, we can't have a computer just look at it and know which path to take like we would. This is the kind of process it would go through. Maybe depth first search. So depth first search explores a path until a leaf node, which is something at the edge, before it traverses back. So if you look at this specific problem, depth first search would be perfect because the first um, outcome that it finds is actually the best outcome. It's the shortest outcome. However, we'd have to traverse every single possibility in this tree to find that outcome. Right. Let's make things a little bit more interesting. So if we had a cost involved of moving, and let's say we're working in an environment that has some weird gravity, where going up and down is more effort than moving left or right. So we'll, we'll give it five points for, or five cost for going up and down, and only one cost for moving left or right. What ends up happening is you could use an algorithm called best first search or A star search, if you've heard of that before. And what this is, it's essentially smarter than your typical brute force algorithms, like breadth for search or depth for search. And it takes your distance to your goal into account, as well as some kind of cost involved. So this, it's going to be a bit difficult for you to see these numbers, but I've assigned these costs to the different moves we've, we've been making. And if you look at that one down there, it costs 27 to reach that goal because we're moving up and down quite a few times. Now depth for search is no longer our best option because the lowest cost outcome is actually down here because we're not moving up and down as often. So you can see that if we introduce this cost into the problem space, using depth for search is not going to be our most optimal solution. And something like best for search or A star search is going to be way more efficient for us because it takes this cost into account as well as our di uh, distance to the goal in, in, in the case of A star. So this is one algorithm that's um, really simple to implement that can be really powerful if you're trying to solve a problem like this. What kind of problems would you be solving? So things like network routing. If you've got um, you know, requests going through different nodes on a network, Essentially, it's a graph that you're trying to traverse. And best, best for, uh, breath for search, depth for search, best for search, A star search, these are all uh, algorithms that would be really effective in that scenario. Trying to solve a problem like a Rubik's Cube. Again, you want to figure out all the different possibilities, but you know there's some heuristics um, towards your goal. So your heuristics might be how many 
colors are on the, how many of the same colors on the same face of that cube right that's a heuristic that you that you're using even pathfinding so your distance towards the goal with perhaps density of traffic could be a good measure as to you know how well you're doing going from point to point towards your goal and then games yeah, this is used quite heavily in games still today for pathfinding your enemies uh, in, in the games are usually using some sort of um, kind of, they need to navigate through uh, the, the terrain, avoid walls or rocks or whatever the, the obstacles may be. And uh, these search algorithms are still used quite intensively to help do that. Right, and maybe if you're packing. So we want to fit a certain amount of uh, items into your little block and we need to optimize that space. It can be represented really nicely as a graph or a tree. The next one I want to talk about is evolutionary algorithms. And one of the problems that are classically used is a knapsack problem. So you've got a bag that can hold a certain amount of weight. You've got some items and you want to figure out what is the best or optimal um, chosen items to put in that bag whilst maximizing value. So maybe something that weighs a lot like this axe has very low value, so it might not be a very good decision to put that into the bag, right? And in this scenario, if we just look at it for a little bit, it would be easy for us to figure out what goes in the bag and what doesn't. But what happens if we have just 26 elements, right? And we need to figure out the best configuration to put into that bag. And it's no longer numbers like nine or four, it's bigger numbers, it's in the thousands and the millions. How would we go about doing that? It becomes very difficult for us to figure that out, and a brute force approach might be quite tricky. So an evolutionary algorithm might be a good option. These are the steps involved in, in the evolutionary algorithm or a, a genetic algorithm. So the first thing we need to do is encode our solution space so that it can be used. Um, set the parameters, create a population. So before I go further, I want to explain the general idea here. Ev uh, genetic algorithms are inspired by evolution. So the whole idea is that we have chromosomes that we get from our parents, and those get mixed, and they have certain traits. So maybe one parent is really strong and the other one's really intelligent. We might end up being a little bit strong and a little bit intelligent. Or we might be getting both strength qualities from both parents. So at a very basic level, that's essentially what evolutionary algorithms work on. Now furthermore, you need to measure an individual's fitness in an environment. So if I have two parents that give me intelligence, but I live out in the wild, I'm probably going to die very young. I have no strength, right? I have no strength to protect myself. But give me intelligence and I'm in the corporate world, I might do very well. And that's the whole concept of natural selection. So given your environment, you might die early or you might survive. You might be strong in that environment. And that's if you do subscribe to the notion of, of evolution or Darwinian evolution, that's essentially what it describes. And what this algorithm is trying to do is it's trying to use those traits and use those uh, quirks of that theory to solve problems. And it works really well in computer science, so I think it supports that theory quite a bit. So essentially, you want to encode that space into something that represents individuals, create a population of them, measure the fitness of each individual, um, and then you go into the cycle of selecting parents, reproducing offspring, mutating them, measuring their fitness, killing off the weak, it sounds brutal, um, and doing this for many cycles. So if we are to encode the solution space, and we had these 26 items uh, through ones and zeros. Ones mean that that item is included in the knapsack, and a zero means that item is not included in the knapsack. You would have an individual that looks something like this, just zeros and ones. We're including, we're not including the axe, but we're including this bronze coin, and we're including the crown, but we're not including the diamond statue. And you end up with many different variants of this, and this is essentially your population. And this will go up to a population size that you set. And then we can do these interesting things like crossover. If we have two parents that look like that, we'll get children that look like that. 
And how does that happen? Well, one, the simplest form of it is a single point crossover. And we're going to go right through the center. We're going to take the first part of parent A, make child A, second part of parent B, and add that for child A, and vice versa for the second child. And that's the simplest form of crossover. You get two point crossover, and you get very varying different ways to do this. Then you have mutation. So we look at that zero, randomly select a, a gene. Each in the individual block is called a gene that comprises this chromosome. Um, we select it and we change it. So we'll take that zero and make it a one. Or we'll take this uh, one over here and make it a zero. And that's done quite randomly because in real life evolution, these mutations happen. So although you share qualities of both your parents, you yourself have some uniqueness to you. And that's through mutation. Okay, and then we can measure fitness. So we want to measure the total value of that individual within the constraint. So in our case, we want to measure how valuable are all the contents in this bag for that specific configuration and does it not violate the weight constraint of the bag? So obviously the bag can only hold a certain weight. So we're saying we're going to add up the value of the sword, the ring, and the crown, for example's sake. And as long as it doesn't violate the weight constraint, that's going to be the fitness of that individual. Then we come to selection. So how do we select individuals? We can't be, one, one option is called elitism. We group the best individuals and we kill off all of the, the underperforming ones. The problem with that is it reduces diversity. So you'll find that a really strong parent with a really weak parent might produce a child that's even better than them both. Um, and by killing off the weak, you reduce diversity. So one way to get around that is roulette wheel selection, where you assign a probability of being selected to each individual, and you randomly spin the wheel. And if it lands on that, that individual, they get selected. And this is done many times until you've uh, populated your, your entire population. So let's look at some code for this. So this is an example here of, uh, can you see that okay? Yeah. Um, this is an example of a brute force approach. It's basically getting all combinations for our 26 items here. The first value indicates the weight and the second value indicates the value. Uh, or it's, yeah, it's value in the knapsack. We'll get all combinations, we'll compute their fitness, and we'll try to find the best one. Now, as I said, that might not be optimal, right? So if we look at our genetic algorithm approach, what we want to do is we still have our items, we create a population, we can calculate their fitness, um, for the population and the individual, and we can, we can do the selection process. So if we look down here, essentially this is, what happen this is what's happening. We're creating a, gen a global population of size 100. We're, cal we're calculating their fitness. We're selecting ones that are chosen, storing them in this variable called the chosen. Then we're reproducing a bunch of children and mutating the children and then creating our new population. We're doing this for a number of iterations and we, we decided we'll do it for a thousand generations. So if we run this, we've got here a total population of 123. I didn't limit the population. I let it grow gradually. And it gave me a 94 or almost 95% best individual. How did I calculate what the best individual was? I did a brute force. So let's look at some statistics. The brute force had to go through 67, listen properly, 67 million 108,864 iterations. Right? And it got 100% accuracy, obviously, through the brute force. It took about seven minutes on this machine over here. 
Whereas the general, uh, genetic algorithm between 100 and 1,000 generations got about a 96% accuracy, and it ran in one second, more or less. All right, so you can see the trade-offs you're making here. This is way more efficient if accuracy isn't that important. Okay, you don't need 100% accuracy. If you're working on military missiles, probably don't use a GA algorithm. You probably want to have something that's more definite. <coughs> Um, okay, I showed you the code. So where can this be useful? So one thing that people have been trying with it is predicting stock markets. Um, we had a team that, we have this tech accelerator thing at work, and they used the GA with some machine learning to um, predict the stock market, and it was doing pretty well with fake money. Uh, I don't know if they've tried it with real money, but that's a possible use for it. Generating imagery or generating any sort of um, um, data, it might be pixels, it might be music notes, whatever the case might be. GAs are used a lot with that, together with neural networks, to figure out can a computer generate artwork? And if they generate a piece of artwork, can we identify it as a good, good piece of artwork or bad piece of artwork? Selecting important features. So if we have a set of data like this, and we pass it through some machine learning algorithm, and I'll go through machine learning a bit in, uh, just now. What features are important for that algorithm to work op optimally? And a GA could be used for that, because it's mixing all of these different possibilities or permutations. And it's very useful when you have lots of them. Um, if we need to figure out a circuit board and how what configuration might be optimal um, for a specific uh, use case, this is actually, GAs have been used quite a bit in that industry to figure out best design for circuitry and things like that. And as I mentioned, music, audio, we, you could use a GA to generate some nice, hopefully nice sounding music. Um, and you either use a human or some function, fitness function, to determine if that music sounds good or not. Okay, so at its core, GAs are great at optimization. Next topic, machine learning. So we've been through old AI, which is the planning and searching and, and uh, the basic stuff. We've been through evolutionary algorithms, which explain, uh, which basically work on Darwinian evolution theory. And now the hot topic these days is machine learning. What is machine learning? So if we look at this graph over here, or this chart of apples versus oranges, and we're measuring their smoothness versus their weight, we can see a pattern here, right? And that pattern mean is, is something like that. Everything above the line is one of the fruits, and everything below the line is the other fruit. But you will see that some of them kind of sneak through the gaps. Right? So in machine learning, what we're essentially trying to do is find this line that separates different pieces of data. We have supervised learning, which this would be the case. We know which are the apples, and we know which are the oranges. Unsupervised learning, you don't have those labels. You want to figure out are there clusters of data that are grouped in a certain way? And then we can investigate it more to find those trends and maybe assign labels to them. So in this example, if we didn't know that these were apples and oranges, we could still see that there is some sort of trend that's happening, and we can use that information uh, to make decisions. If you had it look something like this instead, um, maybe your line looks something like that. So from a mathematical perspective, we all could compute this. We all know how to do this linear algebra. It's really simple. But how do we do something like that? It can become a bit more complex. And the whole point of machine learning, at least supervised machine learning, is to figure out that line. Okay, and then what if you have a 3D space where there's maybe smoothness, weight, and um, radius or size, right? it becomes even more difficult to make that line because that line is now a plane that you need to compute. And that's exactly what supervised learning is trying to do. This is the general process of figuring that out. Collect and understand your data. Prepare your data. Train your model. That's actually where the machine learning is happening. Evaluating your model and improving the performance of your model. So if you've spoken, or if you know of any data scientists, and you think they, they are doing really cool stuff, like putting Obama's face on Trump or something like that, they're not. They're actually just 
fixing data, preparing it and understanding it, and trying different models uh, that give you a better performance. It's experimentation. And if you think about data science and machine learning, it's nothing new. It's based on statistics. And we've been doing it for years. It's just become more powerful now because we have more access to data and more better com computing power. So if we think about data science or analytics, have you heard of descriptive analytics? No, but it's something you've probably done before. You've made a report probably for one of your clients or your boss. That's describing something, describing data. Uh, predictive analytics is essentially what we were trying to do now. We're trying to predict what would be an apple and what would be an orange. And the next step is prescriptive analytics. Can we advise a business or can we advise uh, someone in a specific context what they should do based on data? So we've found a trend, what should you do with it? One of the simplest forms of machine learning is linear regression. It basically finds the distance between um, a point and some sort of line between all of the points. And this will give you a straight line uh, classif classification of a set of data. This is the simplest uh, type of machine learning. Decision trees, these are still very useful. So if we had a decision, do we eat pizza? And we, we see in this um, path here, it, does it have onions? No. Does it have onions? Yes. Does it have cheese? Maybe we like cheese and onion pizza. So we'll take that. Maybe on this path, does it have pineapple? Yes. Okay, we're not gonna eat that pizza, right? So let's quickly look at some basic code for this. Um, if you want to get started, by the way, this is Python code. Uh, if you wanted to get started, there's a really useful library called scikit-learn. And what we've done here is we've put um, some data in here. So each of these represents a vehicle. It's top speed, it's weight, weight should be in kilograms, uh, and then fuel type, is it a petrol or diesel vehicle? So in this case, this thing's top speed is 180 kilometers per hour, it weighs one ton, and it is a petrol vehicle. Zero is petrol and one is diesel. And now we've classified them. We know that's a car, the second one's a truck, the third one's a truck, the fourth one's a car, the last one's a truck. And we're using a decision tree classifier, and with these four lines of code, or three lines of code, we can now predict what something would be. So given it's trained on the small set of data here, and it's figured out a decision tree. And if we provide it with a top speed, a weight, and the fuel type, it would give us a prediction. So if we run this quickly, it's predicted that something with a top speed of 133 kilometers per hour, that's 3.7 tons, that's a diesel, is likely a truck. Okay, With just this little piece of data. Now what do you think is happening happening under the hood there. It, it's probably something like this. So if we think intuitively about it, determining if it's a car of, or a truck, it's gonna, fi it's gonna build a decision tree for us. It's gonna do something like, is the speed greater than 120? Yes. Is, it, um, is the weight greater than 1.5 tons? Yes. Is the fuel type one? Is it diesel? And then maybe it will result in a truck. So it builds out this entire tree and it basically makes these decisions when you give it new data. And that's in essence what a decision tree does. Neural networks, this is another really powerful machine learning um, algorithm. And it's used in very versatile ways. It's used for the machine learning that we've been looking at. It's used for deep learning with imagery, um, with all sorts of sensor data. Essentially, it consists of some set of inputs, a hidden layer that does magic, and then gives you an output. So this green part here, weights and hidden layer, it's doing something very simple. It's taking in all of the inputs, applying a weight to it, summing them, using an activation function to decide, should I fire or shouldn't I fire? So neural networks are based on how neurons work in our brain, or they try to simulate how neurons work in our brain. We receive inputs, we have them travel down neurons, they're biased in some way, and they provide an output. And this is done through billions of neurons in our heads. 
and we've seen them be useful in, in, um, in solving a lot of problems that we have to deal with. I can't, I don't have the time to go into, um, into the neural network topic now, but there is a whole hour long talk that I've done on this in the past and it's on YouTube for you to have a look. Similar, it should be very friendly, it's very visual like this, so I think if you're interested in that topic specifically, go have a look at the talk. So where's this stuff useful? Back to where we started. This kind of stuff where we're working with in imagery, we're working with kind of more general intelligence. We don't want to work with apples or oranges. We want to look at pictures of this room and identify what are people, what are chairs, what are phones, um, and then maybe link that with other sensory data to, to help us understand what is happening or help us make decisions. This is where machine learning is, is very powerful. But as you can see, there's room for all of these different algorithms that we looked at. Um, unless you're an AI researcher, you wouldn't care what the definition of AI is. You want to use something to help you solve your problem or help you innovate. So I think to close, not all nails are the same. So we want to, we hear about machine learning and we want to use it in the, in the space that we're working in. But maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe a simple search algorithm would be uh, more useful. Maybe an evolutionary algorithm would be more useful. Or maybe a machine learning algorithm is the way to go. So I think what I wanna, want you to take away from here is experimenting with these different topics can be very useful in the work you're doing and it doesn't have to be the most cutting edge latest technology or concept or buzzword. Uh, use what makes sense for you. And in my opinion, experimentation is key to doing something new, doing something different, slowly pushing the boundaries. Um, no huge change just happens overnight. Um, every time you read about something new, it's happened through years of experimentation and trying out different things. So I would encourage you to experiment. And if it has no benefit to your work, it will help you grow. Always keep growing, always keep learning. Um, be curious, think about um, how things could work in your environment, think about what kind of developer you want to be 10 years from now, what kind of concepts would you need to learn to get there. And even if you never use them, it will help you grow. Thanks, that's it from me. Um, this is actually some of the content from a book I'm writing with Manning, uh, Grokking AI Algorithms, so it should be in early access soon. Also very visual, like the pictures you've seen through the slides. Um, yeah, and keep in touch. You can find all the videos and things on the website, and if you want to get hold of me, you can follow me on Twitter. Thanks for your time.